To become a legend in your own lifetime, you have to be very special. Martin of Fire is certainly that. In three seasons as a rugby league professional, Martin Afai has stamped himself as a candidate for the Sports Hall of Fame. To win such exclusive membership, he must maintain the astonishing rate of progress achieved through his unique skills. Speed is the prime asset, he's the fastest thing rugby league has seen for decades. But that's not all. Although very much an individual, he loves to be part of a team, especially a successful one. He's a showman, a flamboyant artist who wants to be remembered as much as an entertainer as a sportsman. Hard now to think he was born within the sound of bow bells and sent by his Nigerian parents to primary school. They were good days, and obviously I don't remember much work getting done. Um, it was just a case of going to school for about 8 o'clock so you can kick a ball around to 9 o'clock and then kick a ball around at lunchtime again and kick a ball around after school as well. And as I say, they were, they were good days. I didn't get down to much work and really until the fourth year. And I think my 11 plus suffered for that. And I think I was... Uh, Thankful that my brother was quite intelligent, so they automatically let me go to Wolverson Hall. Because if your brother was there, they gave you special dispensation. So I think yeah, I've got to, you know, uh, got to thank him for that, really. Because if not for him, I might not. They might not have let me into the school. This was Wolverson Hall in Ipswich. Yeah, that was uh, one of the two boarding schools that Ilya had. It was a grammar school at the time, and obviously went comprehensive like most of the schools went in the late seventies, early eighties. And uh, they were, that's when I was first introduced to, to rugby and uh, first time I'd really been away from home for any length of time. And they were good days as well. This precocious talent was recognised in selection for the English schools rugby union team. And then he took his boots to one of London's top clubs, Roslyn Park. There's a, a funny misconception. Some people seem to think that just because you've signed for rugby league, you automatically, I automatically became a good player overnight and, and I never used to score tries before. I mean... I was at Roslyn Park for two seasons and I only played half the first season because the first part of uh, the first season I was, I was at Roslyn Park, I was languishing in the fourths and fifths, as you do when you turn up on a, uh, a rugby union club's doorstep with, with not many you know, credentials. Uh, you just start from the bottom and work your way up. And uh, I was the top scorer both s seasons in London and uh, at Roslyn Park. So, you know, I'd scored a few tries before. Witness coach Doug Lawton was the man who spotted Martin on TV. I never seen him live. The first time I saw him live was in our first team against Halifax. I mean, if it's a gamble, then I took a gamble with Joe Lyon, I took a gamble with Andy Gregg, I took a gamble with Mick Burke. I mean, I've only seen Colotto for two minutes on Wales television. So I'm a great believer in first impressions. You know, I think that like you can explain away your first impressions or you can not believe them. But I'm one that says, well, if that's my first impression, everything that's in my mind is there. Because like I've played with the Volanovans and the Bostons and the Ashtons and all the great players. I've been I've been lucky to be at clubs where they've always been great players, like St Helens, Wigan, and Witness. And I think mixing with great players, you get to know. I might be just somewhere they walk. I don't know. You get to, to recognise a great talent when you see one. The first we really heard of Martin was off a television producer who was watching the television, uh, watching the actual match, and uh, it was the Hong Kong Sevens. And it was, we were playing at Witness, and he just happened to mention to us all the bar, there's a, there's a flying wing man playing for Roslyn Park called Okea. So we looked through the boots, there's no such player like. Anyway, the week after, they're on the television again in the sevens. And sure enough, this black chap from his armor wing, there had a big bandage around his leg. And uh, his name was Martin Afire. And then I was watching the barber in Cardiff. I think it was Bill McLaren and... I thought it was Nigel Starman Smith or somebody saying, when this boy gets in the England team, it'll be a tremendous, exciting talent. So I thought I'd better get uh, off my backside and get down there and see that. I tried to get in touch with him, which was you couldn't like, he was ex-directory. So uh, I phoned the secretary of Rosling Park and told her I was looking for a up-and-coming young, you know, rugby union lad, you know, we're doing a bit of a story on rugby union wing wing, up-and-coming lads. And, um, you gave me Martin's phone number. Uh, the f first time I actually met uh, Dougie Lawton and uh, Eddie McDonald in the in the pub in in the East End of London, uh, which was because they couldn't actually fire my house, so I, I directed them to, to the nearest pub and I met them there. And uh, remember them asking me if I wanted a drink, you know, and we ordered uh, a 
a couple of drinks and uh, I ordered an orange, I might add. And uh, yeah, we were just about to sit down at a table and uh, Eddie McDonald knocked a, a pint of, or a half a pint of lager all over a pair of white jeans that I had on at the time. Not yellow, it was a Dougie <laughs> It's the popular one. story, isn't yeah. it? Like, Dougie's got a bad memory. I know, I can't imagine myself in the yellow pair of trousers, actually. I got round the main objection, which was England cap. And at the end of the day, you've got to be honest, and you've got to come down and say, well, what I'm doing basically, I'm putting a price on an England cap. Yeah. I mean, and Marty can say, as he did say, that there is no price on an England cap, I want an England cap. But as I say, that was an objection we had to get over. What decided you to turn professional? Was it purely the money? Oh, I wouldn't actually say purely the money, but I look at it more like, uh, you know, I, I could make a career at being a sportsman. It's not too many people, I can say that, you know, get paid for things, you know, that they actually enjoy. And uh, whether I was getting paid for rugby or whether I was not, you know, that was something I, I wanted to do. I mean, I think I've got a gift for spotting great players. And I'm very pleased that God gave it me. It's a wonderful gift to possess, it's been my job. Now there's a chance for a player. He's taken the pass, and he's only got the fullback to beat for his strength and speed. Take it past him. Yes, they will. The high skipping of fire is in. Try number 42. The fire's electric pace and devastating finish were by this time the talk of rugby league. It was all too much for Hunslet on this occasion. The championship trophy was on the horizon in his first season. And so was try number 43 in all matches. What a phenomenal first season it turned out to be. Once he'd crossed the Runcorn line for his first try, Martin never looked back. Records began to tumble at his feet. There were 42 tries for his club alone, and in one superb sequence he reeled off tries in 15 consecutive matches, 11 of them in the first division. In response to public demand, he won his first international call. That was against France in Avignon. The match resulted in a comfortable win for Malcolm Reilly's side, and on the hour, Martin of Fire launched his test career with his first try in typical fashion. It was to be the first of many. Two and a half years on, Martin enjoys some of the trappings of being an international celebrity. He's a household name at home and abroad, was guested on television quiz shows, appeared in fashion magazines and gets regular fan mail. All unthinkable, when he came north for his very first training session at Witness, that was in the summer of 87. I remember coming down and being introduced to all the players one by one and I think I was introduced to Darren Wright and Andy Currier and Rick Thackeray and a few others and shook their hands and sat down and you know, thought, there's quite a big lads, a few of these. And I remember, my first impression was I remember thinking, you know, like asking them what position they play and they all said centre, centre, wing. And I thought, you know, where's all the forwards? Expect, you know, to think uh, in second when rugby union, uh, it's normally the for forwards, the second rows who are the tallest people like Andy Currier and Darren Wright. But I must admit, I was quite amazed at the size of uh, some of the players. Did the names mean anything to you? Well, I, before I actually uh, signed uh, for Witness, I remember Dougie Law and telephoned me, and uh, I remember my first thoughts after the telephone call were, Witness, aren't they that team that play in red and white? They're not bad, so that shows a bit about my knowledge of rugby league before I joined. But no, I must admit, I had heard of, uh, before I uh, actually uh, arrived at my first training station, I had heard of Kurt Sorensen. I had heard of Tony Myler, but I think that was about it as far as uh, the witness player personnel was concerned. What was your attitude going into that session? Were you apprehensive or were you absolutely determined to put on a show? I was. I've always been like that. I've always thought that first impressions count. And I must admit, especially when it came down to the sprint, and you know, I wanted it to be known that there was a new kid on the block, as you know, as to say. And uh, I think that I, I turned a few heads, you know, which is always a good thing to do. And, and things went well pretty much from day one. When he came down for the first training session, we had a game of tick and pass, and uh, it really proved to us from then, uh, from the first training session, that uh, he had the ability to uh, go all the way, and he's proved that. How much did you have to teach rugby league into him as opposed to rugby union, which he played until? Well, not really that much, really, because uh, being a winger, there's not much difference. Um, not very often they get caught with a ball in uh, rugby union, so uh, there's only the fact of playing the ball um, and a little bit of defence, but they uh, picked that up on the, on the way, so there was, wasn't much coaching involved. You pitched him straight in. You didn't even put him in the A team. You, you decided to put him in against Halifax in the first team. That was a bit yes. unusual. That's very unusual for me, because I like to think that once I've signed a player, I like to think I'd give him as easy a transition as I can, because it is a different game. Having said that, wing is probably the easiest place to make the transition in. 
But to be honest, he came training. I mean, when I left him in London, I said, now, the next thing, when I see you up in about five weeks, come up and be the fittest you've ever been. Lead the, lead all the, win all the races, and he did all of those things. I mean, the lads, you know, they'd have left him out, the lads would have started going crazy because he was whipping them all to pieces and taking pass. So we stuck him in. I think it was about five or six games before he scored, but... Has it sort of changed your game at all, though, playing alongside him? Well, it has. I think before Martin came, uh, Witness went through a period where they didn't have real specialist wingers. John Bassett had just left and he, he filled that gap. And he brought me along well, because I'd only just started off real at the same time. Yeah. Did you ever try and keep up with him? Well, I'd take over him half the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's always nice to know that uh, whatever you break, he's got uh, good vision, uh, support vision, and uh, he tends to be on uh, on one of your shoulders, so it's, uh, you don't you know, initially run to his left wing, you run where the gap is, but uh, if you make space, you, uh, you know, he's usually there. Well, it's a good long kick again, and a fire streaking towards the ball. Gibson goes back, oh, makes a slip, the fire's got a chance here as he hacks ahead, and the fire surely is in for a try! A disastrous mistake by Steve Gibson. This was a try which showed another side of Martin of fire. Pace gave him the chance to pounce on a mistake, but it was allied to courage. Self-preservation ignored as he injured himself against the post in the act of scoring. The world's price had come to witness the rugby league debut of Jonathan Davies, but a fire was not to be upstaged. Now they're coming at Paul Hume. So it looks like two more important uh, championship points here for Witness, who started the day three behind the leaders, Castleford. And the fire come, and the fire comes into the action, and you don't stop Martin the fire. Well, they've come to acclaim a new hero, but the fire's not going to be out of the spotlight for very long. His was a breathtaking performance in this match by any standards. Every one of his tries is different. His witness teammates obviously look out for him whenever possible close to the line, and he enjoys scoring so much he's usually somewhere around. His unique combination of grace and power excites the fans, but Afaya's trademark is his showmanship. Now a break, and the speed of Myla, and Afaya's on the left, and Afaya is away! And he'll be chased all the way, but surely no one can stop Martin Afaya. Try number three. He salutes yet another fine build-up by Witness. And it's turning into a benefit match for Martin Afaya now. Opponents don't always relish a fire's tries as much as his witness teammates. Notice once he gets the ball here how he taunts Salford's ex-Welsh international wingman Adrian Hadley. Come and catch me, he seems to be saying, knowing full well he wouldn't be able to. It's a characteristic that's brought him criticism, but nonetheless it's part of the man's makeup. Most of Martin the Fire's tries are scored in the corner, as you'd expect for a winger. But he does bob up in some unexpected places. In this instance, after a break by Imoshi Koloto, he turns up on the outside of Jonathan Davis, on the right flank. And that was his fourth try of the match. It was a cotton wool introduction to rugby league for Davis, who afforded us one tantalising glimpse of his genius. His day was to come later. This one belonged to Martin of Fire. You give the impression of being supremely confident, and yet I think early on you got quite nervous, especially about the big occasion matches. And didn't you know when you were first sort of mooted as an England player, a Great Britain player, you thought I'm not quite ready. Well, obviously things moved along up pretty quickly, and you know, I believe in taking things as they come. And obviously the more of the importance of the occasion, and I suppose like any other player, I mean, you get nervous. I mean, I would not try and be so bold to say you know that I never got nervous and. And that I wasn't inexperienced. And I'll have to, I mean, I'd played rugby league for what, four or five months before I got my first uh, Great Britain cap. And before the end of the season, I was on the Great Britain tour and I'd become a lion and achieved like what most people try to achieve in, in, in quite you know, a lot longer time, anyway. So I suppose that, yeah, I suppose I, I got nervous. I suppose I don't get as nervous now, but I like to consider myself, you know, a, a more professional player, a more experienced player, you know, who can handle big occasions far better. Shot there as they were picking themselves up one by one, and now there are chances here. Loughlin, a fire on the outside, a fire's in at the corner. <laughs> 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 Two 
Fitness is a key factor for any professional sportsman. Boxing sessions with his best pal, Dave Myers, the Wigan winger, form just one small part of the essential training schedule. Nowadays, I have to work on it a lot more than, uh, than before, because, I mean, there's a lot of people tell you getting to the top is not a hard thing, it's staying at the top, because, you know, I mean, season after season, you know, somebody else, you know, will be coming, trying to knock you off your mantle and, uh, and with the help of the press and, and, and whatever. So I suppose to stay at the top is the hardest thing. So I work on my speed and fitness a lot more than I suppose when I first came to the game. When I'm quite young, you know, you think that everything comes easy and... You don't, so you don't work, you don't try to aspire. But uh, when you are at the top, I suppose you, you realise what more you have to lose and you tend to work at your game, all aspects of your game a lot harder. He's, he's lucky he's got a level of natural fitness. I mean, we often talk about people having natural fitness. Martin has. Um, he can miss a couple of training sessions and still perform on the day as well. And he keeps himself very fit. I mean, he watches what he eats, and he's, he's a natural athlete. He's very dedicated to his sport. Now, you're pretty busy on a Sunday afternoon, obviously, yes. treating all the players' injuries. Are you actually able to enjoy him in full flight when he's charging up down the wing as well? Yes, I am. I'm always sort of um, heart in mouth. I mean, Martin's that type of player where you get a goosebumps. Tony Marler's another player like that, where you think, you know, that you just know they're going to do something extraordinary. He's never failed to, like... Not only amaze me, amaze all the players around the club, all the courts and staff, everybody, you know, because of the things he does. I haven't seen another player in the game of it, those sorts of things. As a watcher, then, he excites you? Yeah, there's been times, like, when my assistant said, we've lost this one, and said, oh, well, Martin hasn't scored yet. So you always think that if you're within the distance, that he might just get in. Paul scrum that for Ayers to win for witness. He's not the regular hooker, of course, as Colotta once more sets off. Oh, and he gets the ball away in the tackle, and Abayer is here! Abayer's got his try! Oh, and isn't he joyful? Abayer knew exactly what was on there. He throws the ball into the crowd, takes the congratulations of the witness fans. Abayer's broken what was for him a barren run. Once the ball was in his hands, he was on his way. <laughs> No one relishes scoring tries more than Martin. His distinctive style lends itself to exuberant celebrations. So whenever he's on his way to the opposition line, you can almost hear him singing in jubilation. His colleagues are used to joining in. But imagine what it's like if you're in the other team. The opposition doesn't always appreciate the antics. I remember a player, and I won't name him, a couple of years ago, he was a bit furious about the fact that I think he'd waved to him on the way past sort of thing. And he said, one day, I'm going to catch him. Now, do you think there are a lot of players with that attitude to Well, well I don't seem too big-headed, but I suppose, uh, you know, obviously, there's going to be a few people that are going to have that kind of attitude towards you. I mean, like anything else, you know, in, in life, if, if they can't you can catch me by one way, I'm sure they'll catch me by another way. It's sort of just part and parcel of the game, obviously. If you're scoring a lot of tries, then people are going to try and stop you no, no, any which way they can. You do like to celebrate tries, though. Do you think you, sometimes you overstep the mark? Oh, well, maybe I do, maybe I don't. I think that's not really the issue. I mean, I enjoy myself, and that's what I, what I enjoy doing. Obviously, I take a lot of stick in, in certain quarters of the press and, and, and so, uh, other areas, you know, other coaches and, and maybe players as well, I don't know. But uh, as I say, I, I like to enjoy the game. I know the game is, is a highly professional game, but... But I still think there's room for characters in the game, and I think it will be a, a sorry state of affairs if rugby league is purely a professional game with no characters and, and people can't come and have a laugh about certain things as well when they come to watch a game on a Sunday afternoon. Brilliant individual that he is, Martin would have achieved nothing without the ball. And that's where playing in a great side comes in. He didn't choose witness, they chose him. But he appreciates he's with the best possible club to exploit his talent. Obviously, it's good, you know, everyone likes to play on a good side, and I think Dougie's got a pretty good side together there. And, and I do enjoy, uh, like, uh, playing for Great Britain and everything, but it's also, it's, you always look forward to, you know, getting back to, to playing with the lads as well. Well, it's like the United Nations in our change room. You know, you've got Australians, New Zealanders, um, Scotsmen, uh, Tongans, Joe Grimm is from Malta. So it's, uh, you know, it's a... It's a cultural shock to everybody who walks in our changing rooms because, uh, you know, but we all mix together, we have a point after the game and it's, uh, you know, witness it's a small family club and, uh, you know, everybody has been welcomed uh, with open arms. 
Let's got a lot down to Doug Lawton. He's got a he's got a, a good bunch of players together. Not only are they you know good uh, actual rugby players, but they're also good lads as well. And, and as you said, they've all come from different backgrounds, different cultures, and they've all got you know like a, an ingredient to add to to the recipe. And obviously, you know things have worked pretty well. Witness's teamwork was never better illustrated than when it came to the crunch in the championship decider against Wigan on April the 16th, 1989. It was winner take all, and the match winner was in a number five shirt. Lucas and Shelford, two props clinging onto him. Paul Hume, Sorensen looking for that gap and airs. Sorensen once more, they've kept it going. Dowd just managed to hold on there. Alan Tate has got support here from Martin and Fire. Everything Martin Afaya does is accomplished at speed. Even in slow motion, he appears unstoppable. In this case, notice the classic S bend which outwits the defenders and turns Wigan inside out. A minute from half time, Tate again does well with the pass. They're throwing the ball around, there's no doubt about that. Tate along the one for Colotto. Colotto inside O'Neill. O'Neill manages to get away from Goodway. Oh, once more, it's out of the handle. And it's been kicked ahead. It's going to be a try for Martin to fire. The referee said play on. The fire picked it up, went over behind the post. The referee awards the try. This was another match revealing all the varying attributes of the modern game's ultimate hero. Not all tries can be classics, but even when teams think they've contained witness, that man of fire can scupper them with a flash of opportunism. He preys on mistakes and plays to the whistle, often to the cost of the opposition. His philosophy is that all tries count the same, whether they're the culmination of an 80-yard dash or a pickup close to the line. But not even a fire gets it right all the time. It wasn't long before the press dubbed the fire chariots for obvious reasons. Wigan's wheels came off when he left everyone in his wake with one of the most memorable tries ever seen on television. Just watch and admire as he seems to take on and beat the entire Wigan team. And again, Willis are trying to spread it. River, long ball out for a fire. Now, what can a fire do this time? Super try! The whole of witness goes absolutely potty. Martin of fire, yet another hat trick. He's having the most sensational season yet again, and from the moment he took the ball in his hands, nothing on this earth was going to stop him. It was a try that had everything: sidesteps, handoffs, awareness, determination elusiveness, blistering pace, of course, and bravado, summed up in one word, class. Little wonder that minutes later, when the championship had been clinched, Witness's worshippers chaired their newest god from the field. It was a day of personal triumph and collective success, a day of never-to-be-forgotten celebration. The second season had been even more spectacular than the first. 60 tries in all, 58 for witness, five in one match against Warrington. There had been eight hat-tricks and a century of tries in all competitions in record time. He was the hottest property in rugby league. He scored 60 tries in your second season. Now that must have given you more pleasure because it meant you'd improved on your first season. Oh, very much so. I've always tried to get better and better and to score 60 tries in my second season was a a great, you know, a gr uh, great, a good feeling, a really good feeling. Mainly because after the first season, as I say, it's not getting to the top, it's staying there and people were saying, you know, after you had this sensational 
tag, you know, the, the papers was all rugby league sensation, sensation this and sensation that, you know. You were, you were never referred to as an established, you know, rugby league player or a class player. And so to come out and do it in the second season, obviously show people that, you know, there must be a bit more to you than speed. You had great expectations of him when you brought him here, obviously. Has he exceeded those expectations? Oh, you'd have to say that, yes. I mean, I knew I had something special, but... I mean, there's a Wigan that goes in my local on the case and say to him, like... I think I said, I said, when I signed Mick Burke, I said, I've signed a great player here. And then when I signed the fire, I said, he said, I'm sick of you. Tell me you've signed great players. I saw a fire play in the Lancashire Cup final, and I don't think he was 100% fit. But even a fire 75% fit, you can see he's a classy wingman. I like the way he runs. He's obviously very fast, and he's, yeah, I think he's a very good wingman. And it's great for the game that people like Martin Fire have come along. Yes, I think we need, actually, we need more characters in the game. You know, uh, if you talk about the 50s and the 60s, you can take any team in the league, you can name five characters. And at the moment, I think you struggle to name five characters, or even two characters in, the, in every side. In my recent history, Martin Fire is not like any other winger. He's just, he's so good, and he's so special in that that special way of, of his own. It just sets him completely apart from everyone else. You've played with and against some of the greatest players. Where would you put him at this moment? Well, I always thought the best winger was Boston, because um, he was pretty fearsome in defence, but I only played against Boston when he was 28, 29. -ish. Now, I think Martin's record is going to be better than anybody else's. And I think that should speak for I certainly think he's better than all the rest, but then to probably say that's because I like him, but I like Billy Boston, you know. <laughs> he's a great mate of Billy's. Yeah. I mean, Billy was, a, a, I mean, put it this way, I'd love a Boston on the other wing, you know. Do you think you'll end up scoring as many tries as Brian Bevan, Van Vollenhoven, Boston? <coughs> I don't know. As I say, I just try to uh, go out and better myself each time and keep on scoring. People always tell me, because obviously I wasn't around in those days, that, you know, that the game now is a lot harder to score tries in. But as I say, you know, I don't really take that as an excuse for scoring or not scoring. I just go out there and give it my best shot. I mean, you can't beat a man for pace. He, he can catch a ball. He, he knows what to do. He reads a game well. I mean, he pops up all over the show. I mean, for anyone who doesn't even understand the game, you can see he's streets ahead of a lot of people.
ever get a feeling before a game this is going to be one of those good days? Yeah, I do. Sometimes I, I you know, sometimes I'm not right, but most of the time, you know, I, I would say I'm a bit of a dreamer. And the night before games, I do tend to dream in, in the dressing room. You know, obviously you try to put yourself in certain positions and obviously see yourself coming out on top and see yourself in the favourable light. And then it's nice when it comes off. You, a bit of a looping pass, but David Smith takes it on. All tackles to go. Kenzie, he's got Paul Hume there. Now there might be a gap. Davis, out and fires over. Martin of fire. Where did he come from? Wriggles over that line. The left winger bobbing up in the right centre position. Well, a fire's 22nd of the season could not have been better timed from a witness point of view. What else turns Martin of fire on? <laughs> well, I don't think we should really get into that in this interview. But I like listening to music and, and relaxing and watching videos and watching television and going to the movies. Those things I, I like doing as well as just going to the nightclubs and, and things like that. It is important though, isn't it, for you to have a life outside of rugby league? I it imagine. is. It's very important to me. It's very important to me. Uh, once, sometimes I do like to get back down to London and just, you know, become a face in the street again. Because I... I I do find that quite enjoyable and going out down there. So it's good to be able to get away from it. And, and when I go out, you know, I don't like to go to places, you know, where, where I'd say that you know, most uh, people who watch rugby would frequent. You know, I like to go to, to different sort of places and and have a good time. And, and just rugby league has forgotten all you know, that for the evening, really. Is it impossible to be just a face in the crowd up here? Well, I suppose it, it more so. It's a lot harder, obviously, you know, up here because. Which is good, really, because the rugby league is uh, becoming more higher profile, which is good for me personally and also good for the game. So you've got to take the, the rough of the smooth, as you know, people say. You've been almost like a father figure to him, haven't you? Yeah, but he's been like... Uh, I mean, because it has to be difficult. You come to a place like Witness, he was probably one of three or four or five black people in the town. Um, he's left London, he's got no relatives up here or nothing. I mean, I think the first Christmas I put a little thing in my column saying we've got a lad up from London who can't go home for Christmas because of all the games. Send him, uh, send him a Christmas card. I think he had about 400 or four. He couldn't open his door anyway. And he came out house for Christmas dinner. But he's like, he's not only like, he's like a son to me, and he's he's pretty damn good with my own children and the wife, you know. What do your mother and father think of the progress you've made as a professional sportsman? Yeah, all well, my family are quite happy. You know, it's good to have a. a family you know, that are behind you in 100 percent of whatever you do obviously they would have preferred me obviously to become a doctor or a lawyer or something like that but uh you know they're happy that you know that i'm making a success in what i've chosen to do are they able to follow your, your career yeah they all they all do they all follow my career my mother doesn't like to watch the game in uh, person my brother's been to a couple of games and and things like that, but uh, they will all watch it on, t on when it's on television. If they can't get games, you know, I, I video some games and send them to them. But uh, as I say, my mother's not too keen on watching it live. I think that, that's uh, got something to do with the fact that she came to watch my brother play at uh, school once, and uh, he got a bit of a bloody nose. So since then, she's never been too keen on uh, on uh, watching us play. You know what mothers are like; uh, very protective about their children. I think you're too quick to get a bloody nose. Oh <laughs> well, uh, I get caught now and then. I get caught now and then. <laughs> but not very often. Although he's inevitably a marked man, a fire is quick enough to avoid trouble. Jonathan Davies is just one of a host of witness stars capable of bringing the best out in him, as just about every team in the league can testify. The ones on the receiving end this time were Hull. The emergence of former Welsh pin-up boy Davies as a genuine rugby league star means opponents have yet another danger man to watch. Winners probably have more match winners than any other club. Tony Myler, David Hume and Imosi Kolota are just three of the others. 
but even they get it wrong sometimes. It is that speed that they've got which uh, seems to be catching Hull out airs into the gap, and away goes Mylan. Oh, and he flings it down to Martin if that was a ball and pass. So the high skipping is to no avail, he throws the ball high almost into the ground. Exasperation for Martin of Fire, but the referee was right. tracks towards the witness line. We've had a few mistakes in the second half of witness. Yes, I think it's time for them now to cut out their sort of fancy football, just steady it all up, get everybody used to feeling the ball again, taking it through, using up your six play of the balls and settling down. They're trying to do everything at 100 miles an hour. And they were so much on top at one stage in the first half, you would have believed it possible. That ball is put down. mistake just what you were talking about try number 38 for Martin of fire and that surely has eased witness into a winning position what an extraordinary man he is witness still have good chances plenty of chances to score Richie is and managed to hold him. <laughs> and a fire has to go back to his left wing position in the hope of getting the ball for his hat trick. Will it come now? Mackenzie and the fire's got back over there. The huge pass is to him. And a fire goes for the corner. It's another Martin of Fire hat trick. But it's the yeah, happy lad. There's no stopping him at all. Hat tricks just keep on coming. Fifth of the season, 16th in his career, and the man is in the record books for all time. The meteoric rise of Martin of Fire has been reflected at all levels. In five international appearances against France, he's scored in four of them. This try in Perpignan must have made him seem like the Scarlet Pimpernel to the French defence. He's so keen to impress on the biggest rugby league stage of all that the Australians and New Zealanders can expect to see much more of Martin of Fire as well. By the end of his third season, a Fire top scorer in the league for the third consecutive time had etched his name firmly in the record books. His feats predictably meant awards were coming his way again. Tonight, the top try scorer receives £25 a try, and the top marksman, £5 a goal. Would you please welcome on stage to receive £1,125 and £975 respectively. A warm welcome, please, for Martin of Fire and Mike Fletcher. In some ways, a disappointing season for you, only 45 tries. Yeah, it's disappointing that I've only got 45, and it's disappointing that you're still only playing 25 pound a try when you're doing the same three seasons ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, Everything else has gone up apart from the 25 pounds a try. Exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> it's got a sense of humour too. More accolades, more awards. Enough to turn anyone's head, you might think. How aware are you of a responsibility towards kiddies? The youngsters who come up and ask for autographs, who want to be the Martin of Fire of tomorrow? Yeah, obviously, I think I, I, I like kids a lot, and, and contrary to what a lot of people think, you know, like uh, you could be coming off after a match and somebody just stepped on your hand, you've got a bad ankle, you've got an injury, and you, you, your first commitment is to, to yourself and to the team to get in there and treat that injury. And, and if you don't stop to sign a, a person's autograph after 80 minutes of intense football, and then uh, tomorrow in the papers it might say, or oh, on the terraces, people say, oh, that might have fire, you know, he's, uh, he's horrible, he doesn't sign kiddies autographs one incident like that they don't like step back and, and look at the situation because uh, I like as I say I like kids a lot and, and I've got lots of time for them and you know like, many a time you know kids come to my door and disturb me at all hours of the day and night and no matter what I'm doing you know I've always like got you no know, time for them. There's a saying in the town that Dougie's done a lot for Martin but that is true he's also done a damn lot for me you know he's helped me side win and he's been a nice uh, 
he's no trouble to have as a, as a, as a coach. I've heard people say he's a bit this, but he's not. I mean, all the stories, any, I mean, you'll always get stories about great players, but he's got wonderful time for kids. He never knocks a kid away. I mean, the little lad from next door coming out, he's only three, he's a smarty, like, from next door kid, a real smart kid. And he said to Martin, when, when he seen the inside of Martin's hand, he said, they're white. He said, to all the rest of it, it's muck. Now, <laughs> the wife looked at me and I just laughed and Martin laughed. I mean, but like, that is it. I mean, a fella, I took him, I went to a wedding once, he wanted to see him, he said, I've got to go to this wedding. I said, he's a mate of mine getting married. Like, so we, we went, I said, you can come to do it. I said, it's only in the local. And the fellow whose wedding was, got a bit out the, uh, over the top, like, and he fell. As he fell off the stool, Martin caught him. So Martin, instead of putting him on the stool, put him with his back to the wall. He said, what have you done that for? He said, well, if you fall that way, he said, I'll be able to catch you. <laughs> so that's that. the kind of fellow he is. He's, uh, he's a star, but he's very human. Oh, he is, yeah. He's, uh, you know, I mean, I won't meet many nicer fellas. What's been the greatest moment for you in rugby league? The greatest moment for me in rugby league? <laughs> That's a pretty hard question because there have been, uh, been uh, hundreds of great moments. But obviously, I suppose the two that stick out, or three that stick out, I suppose, are uh, winning the, the test match against Australia at Wembley, beating Canberra Raiders, and uh, winning the championship, I suppose, against, against Wigan. That title decided we had the last game of the season. But as I say, there's, there's hundreds more that I, that I, could, that I could pick out. And pulling on a Great Britain jersey. I, I see imagine. pulling on the Great Britain jersey, yeah, going on tour, playing playing my first game in the Sydney competition, you know, these are all like moments that I remember but obviously, you know, they're for when I retire. Those things are for when I retire. And the worst moment? Oh well, obviously it's gotta be dropping that ball in uh, in New Zealand in the in the third test of the of the summer tour, of the summer tour in nineteen ninety. Yeah, that'll definitely stick out in my mind as, as the worst moment. Obviously, you know, I think the week before having scored the try which uh, clinched the series, you know, from such a high to come down such a low. But it just uh, it helps you keep perspective and, yeah. and it's not a good thing to happen. You know, it could have happened in a game where we ended up winning by 40 points and nobody would have mentioned it again. But because it happened in such a, a big match, which was beamed live from, from the other side of the world and, uh, and it was the, the for World Cup points and things like that. And even though it did happen in the the beginning of the game, I still managed to score a try, you know, it's, it still hangs over your head and, and, and people, you know, I still, still like to mention it as well and more and more. I remember once a reporter saying to me, you know, did it bug you the fact you dropped that ball? I said, it's not the fact that it, I dropped it now which bugs me, it's the fact that people keep reminding you that's the fact that bugs you. But as I say, it's, it's part of life, you know. I'm a firm believer of taking the ups and the downs and, and you've got a soldier on and, and great things have happened to me even since that. <laughs> A new season gave rugby fans in Wales the chance to see a fire live in action in the charity shield against Wigan at Swansea, and he didn't disappoint them. In the Lancashire Cup final, poor old Salford were on the wrong end of Martin's magic again, and it was a try befitting a forward. The next milestone in the Martin of Fire story was his 100th try in the first division. He chose Castleford as victims for a new chapter of rugby league history. He reached the century more quickly than Billy Boston, Tom Van Vollenhoven or any of the all-time greats. Rugby League honours his achievements, but that doesn't mean that opponents stand back and applaud. The game wouldn't be the same if they did. Soon afterwards, a fire was on his way to the next hundred. And soon after that, on his way to yet another hat trick. Norton Park has rejoiced so many times at the sight of a fire in full flight. Here against Leeds, he's on a Sunday afternoon stroll. Witnesses supporters share with the man the joy he brings with every try. There have been lows too, like the Ashes' defeat by Australia after Britain won the first test at Wembley. 
But within 24 hours of despair at Elland Road, he was back in club action at Oldham, doing what he does best, scoring tries and adding to the reputation of being one of the most exciting players ever to grace rugby league. Martin Afaya is still only in mid-twenties. This is only his fourth year in a sport that's booming. No one personifies its high profile more than Martin Afaya. Do you think he will go on to become one of the all-time greats in rugby league? Well, I think he already has proved that. Um, he's a top uh, try scorer in 100, 100 games, uh, league games. So uh, I think he's proved to everyone already that uh, he is one of the greatest. So uh, it probably won't be too long uh, after he's uh, probably finished that he's in the Hall of Fame. I think he certainly. And I don't think particularly he'd want the allocator that he's the greatest, but I think he probably is. What do you think you'll do when it is all over? You said you might have another 10 years. Yeah, I'd like to think that I have another 10 years. I'm not really looking to retire until I'm at least 35. You know, I know that John Ferguson and Cat in Australia has played on that long. And, and so I'd like to, to think that I could do that as well. But when I retire, you know, I like, I've like i always been a person that's liked to keep my options open. I've never been one to say that... Uh, I'm going to do this in five years, I'm going to do that in seven years, I'm going to do this in ten years. I've always liked to think that, you know, when I get to that stage, I've got the option of doing this, that, or the other, you know. So I like to keep it like that. Obviously, coaching is something that I, that I would like to do. I, I feel that, you know, that I do have quite a big input in, in the teams that I play in now, whether it be for Great Britain or whether it be for Witness, even though that I do play on the wing and there is a bit of a, you know, like a... A stereotype that you know the wingers running out there and they catch the ball and run and that's uh, but that's I mean as people who see me play know that I do, that's not the way I play and as I say I've got Doug Lawton to to thank for that because obviously you know he's he's talked to me a lot and we talk about the game quite a lot and, and things like that. There's one thing you'd be able to sit down because of modern technology and look at a hundred nod tries, two hundred nod, three hundred nod. Maybe. Yeah, maybe you know at the end, I don't know I'm not sure. I think I'm getting close to two hundred now. And, Obviously, you know, I'd like to get past that and, as I say, just keep going and going. I've only been in the game, at the end of the season will be four years, so, you know, with another ten to, to go, you know, who knows how many I could My score. a thousand. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see, we'll have to see how far I get.